So I was, I was, when I got your message here, I did, are you back in this area I'm now? I'm not. I'm okay. in Nashville. So okay. after graduation, I moved out to Baltimore for grad right. school. So I was yeah. there for three years. Yeah, you were John Hopkins, yeah, right? Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay, yeah. great. So yeah. it's good to be back close enough where I can come. Yeah. It was weird because when you said message it, we were actually going to do another change lab oh, yeah? in the fall. Okay. Um, actually, it looked
right, good evening. Can you all hear me okay? Uh, my name is Erin Lewis. I'm the Executive Director for the Center for Innovation and Change here at the University of Evansville. And thank you for allowing my, my young daughter McKenna to accompany me here tonight because I would not have missed this for the world. Um, in a career in civics, you get a chance to work with some pretty inspirational projects. And topping that list are the students and faculty who worked on the Scholars for Syria project uh, back in, I think it was 2016, 17 time frame. Uh, these students with their Syrian partners worked to do original research in developing programs that would decrease biases in the K through 12 education system and a wide range of other projects. And it started as a gap project, which is now called Change Lab. And it went for several semesters. The students presented on their research, which was publishable, and people were in tears at it. And it was just one of the most inspirational partnerships that I have ever seen in a 20-year career in civics. And so when given the chance to, to welcome this community back, to share their stories and their knowledge with us, uh, didn't hesitate. And so thank you so much for allowing me to give a brief welcome to the Scholars for Syria program, which is now we are welcoming in a new speaker. So I'll turn it over to your host tonight and just give a warm welcome to this group who's going to enlighten us and inspire us as they always do. Thank you, Erin, for kicking us off this evening. We are so appreciative of the Center for Innovation and Change for their help in making tonight's event possible. As Erin was mentioning, Scholars for Syria has a special relationship with the Center for Innovation and Change, having been involved in the Legacy Gap program, now called Change Lab, as well as their Changemaker Challenge. This event tonight would not have been possible without their support. So thank you, Erin, Brooksy, and the Center for Innovation and Change. My name is Kendra Mailing, and I'm a University of Evansville alum. And during my time at UE, I was active in the Scholars for Syria student organization. I'm so happy to be here this evening and see so many familiar and new faces in the crowd. I'd like to thank our in-person and virtual audience for attending this evening. This is our first event at UE in three years, and we're so grateful for the continued support from our local Evansville community and from our growing network of supporters across the country. Tonight, we have folks joining us from the East Coast to the West Coast and even internationally. On that note, I do have one brief housekeeping item. For those of you who are viewing the live stream tonight from the UE webpage with the purple outline, I invite you to click on the title of the live stream, which will take you to the direct YouTube link. That YouTube link will have a chat feature to enable you to ask questions and interact with us tonight. If you're already on that YouTube page, you're one step ahead. Before we dive in, I do want to start with a brief recap of the history of Scholars for Syria as a student organization at UE and provide an update on where we are today. The first Syrian student came to the University of Evansville in August of 2012, almost 10 years ago. At its peak, the University of Evansville had 23 Syrian students, in large part because of the Syrian Scholarship Fund that was made available to support students coming to the US to pursue higher education. At that point, the University of Evansville had the third most Syrian students of any university in the United States, second only to Monmouth College in Illinois and the Illinois Institute of Technology. Around that time in 2016, Scholars for Syria launched as a student organization co-founded by Gail Vignola, who's joining us virtually tonight, and Walid Hassanato, who will be joining us in person later this evening. From the start, our mission has always been to educate the community on the Syrian conflict, to resist sweeping generalizations, to help alleviate the suffering of refugees, and better support our Syrian students and their families, both here and abroad. Between 2016 and 2019, our organization hosted many on-campus and community events. We hosted annual lecture series covering the political context of the crisis, 
discussing the path to reconstruction and imagining the future of Syria and its youth. We sponsored multiple film viewings, overflowing some of the lecture halls in this very building with students and community members who were eager to learn more about the ongoing conflict. We conducted educational outreach, as Erin was describing, in local middle and high schools, creating opportunities for our Syrian students to speak directly with Evansville youth, both about the crisis and just relatable topics like their favorite foods and music and sports. We partnered with Books Not Bombs, a student-led campaign creating scholarships for displaced Syrian students. And in 2019, Scholars for Syria and the University of Evansville won the International Institute of Education High Scale Award for Higher Education in Emergencies. Finally, we're excited to share that we've also had two publications since 2019. As you can see, we've been quite busy over the last several years. But the presence of Syrian students at UE has waned since 2019 largely due to Trump's travel ban implemented in 2016, as well as the first of our several cohorts of students graduating. Today, Scholars for Syria exists as a student organization at Seton Hall University in New Jersey, under the tremendous leadership of Gail Vignola, who we miss dearly in Evansville. We continue to have an online presence, sharing news and updates about the ongoing conflict and our continued efforts to support Syrian students. Scholars for Syria also now partners with EDSEED, an international project that crowdfunds and finds employment opportunities for Syrian students. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce tonight's presenter, Dr. Bashar Murad. Dr. Murad is a nephrology specialist in Newburgh and has served as a keynote speaker for several of our Scholars for Syria events over the years and is an active member of the Syrian American Medical Society. Tonight, we welcome him as he speaks about the ongoing conflict in Syria and highlights the important mission of the Syrian American Medical Society. Following his presentation, we'll have a Q&A session so for those of you joining us online, feel free to pop your questions into the chat function. And those of you in person, hang on to your questions as we'll be sure to, to revisit them at the end of the presentation. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Murad. Thank you, Erin, for this nice introduction. And thank you for Scholars of Syria for inviting me back to speak about this subject that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Lewis, for uh, allowing us to be here and co-sponsoring the program. Uh, this program could have not been done uh, without you know, your help and the, a lot of work behind the scene by Scholars uh, for Syria. So thank you very much. So I want to talk to you about Syrian American Medical Society and the relief work that they are doing in Syria and the surrounding countries. But before I get to that, I want to give you just a brief background on what has happened in Syria for those of you who are not very familiar with the issue. Uh, do we have the change slides? Just use the arrow button on the key. Here you go. So this is just an overview of Syria and where it's located geographically. Um, Syria used to be a very beautiful country. It is sitting on the east coast of uh, the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, as you can see, you know, to the north of it is Turkey and then Europe. To the southwest is Africa and Asia. Uh, it was going all the way to the east. We have very long borders with Turkey to the north. We have a lot of borders with Iraq to the east, with Jordan to the south, and Lebanon to the west. This is a zoom in on the Syrian map, where you see that there are 13 provinces in Syria. The large one in terms of population is Damascus, which is the capital of Syria. And it is towards the south, where you see the red uh, star there. 
The largest in area is the one in the middle, that's Homs, and including Palmyra. And the largest in terms of economic impact is Aleppo, which is to the north of Syria. A little background about the ethnic and religious diversity that we have in Syria. In Syria, about 70 to 75% of the people are Arabs, but it is not all Arabs. We have Kurds, we have Armenians, we have Greeks, we have Turks, we have a Syrian and Syriac that are mainly in the northwest part of Syria, and they are mostly Christian. We have gypsies and Yazidis and some other minorities. So really, it is a very diverse you know, uh, uh, culture. In terms of religious diversity, about 70 to 74% of Syrians are Muslim, uh, Sunni Muslims. And I hate to say that, you know, as a Muslim, we did not have the differentiation, to be honest with you, between Sunni and Shia before the war started. I grew up in Syria and I lived my first 27 years there. My friends next to me, you know, in the classroom, you know, I didn't know if they were Sunni or Shia or, if, you know, Christian, probably because of their names. But this was never an issue in Syria growing up. But now it seems like, you know, this has become a big issue because of the involvement of Iranian government and the Iranian militia and bringing a lot of Shia Muslim uh, to, the, uh, to Syria itself in an attempt to change the demographics. Nevertheless, before the war, we had about 70 to 74 percent of the population that was Sunni Muslim. About 60 percent of those were Arabs, 11 percent were Kurds, and 3 percent were Turks. The Muslim Shia represent about 13 to 17 percent of the population in Syria. And that includes the Alawites, which is the sect that has been governing Syria for the past 50 years and more. We had 3% of Druze. We had about 10% of Christian population. Uh, and they belonged to several churches there. Some of them belonged to the east, and some of them uh, were with the Assyrian church, the one I mentioned in the northwest part of Syria. We also had about, we used to have more Jewish population in Syria, but during this conflict, most of them fled the country, and we probably have less than 1% now. The Syrian revolution started on March 15, 2011. It was inspired by the Arab Spring that started in Tunisia and quickly moved to Libya, Egypt, and then Syria and Yemen. As you see here, I call it the Syrian revolution. And I myself, like a lot of other Syrian, we refuse to call it a civil war because it was never meant to be a civil war. It was not a war between fractions of people you know, in the country um, or based on ethnic or religious differences or anything like that. It was a revolt against government policies including lack of jobs, lack of opportunities, lack of freedom, nobody could speak their mind, the media was controlled by the government, everything was controlled by the government uh, in Syria. For the first six months of the revolution, it was completely peaceful. It was protests in the streets, people are trying to change the regime, trying to ask for more freedoms, at least you know, freedom of uh, uh, expressing themselves, but it was faced with the most brutal response a human being could imagine. The Assad regime that was in power, they decided that they're going to you know, face this peaceful protest with the military might. And that's when things, you know, that's when hell break loose, actually. In doing so, they got the help from the Iranian government and from the Russian government. I'm going to show you some pictures that might be graphic, and I apologize for that. But just to see the magnitude of destruction that has happened in Syria. 
And if you've been watching the news, we're seeing the same thing unfolding in front of our eyes again. It's happening in Ukraine with the same perpetrator, you know, Putin and his allies that, you know, destroying the country and creating another humanitarian crisis. In 2013, there was a massacre in the northwest suburb of Damascus, a city called Daraya, where the whole city was destroyed. There was mass graves, as you see in this picture, for innocent children and women that were killed for no reason. Then in 2013, we had the famous chemical attack. If you all remember the red lines that we drew in the sand when President Obama said that this is you know, a red line and cannot be crossed, it was crossed over and over and over, and there was no response whatsoever from the international community. Children were gasping for air, trying to get to the help they can get. And after all, more than 300 children and women were killed in this attack and buried in mass graves. Then comes 2016, where the regime and its allies, the Iranian and the Russians, decided to bombard Aleppo, the economic engine of Syria. Over several months, there was indiscriminate shelling of the city where they used barrel bombs. You know, they will get uh, the barrel that has the ex explosives in it, and they add to it screws, nails, all kind of metal that will do the most harm to the people when it falls on them and explodes. I'm sorry about this, I cannot see the arrow there. As I said, the shelling was indiscriminate. Um, you know, whether it's places of worship, this is the big mosque of Aleppo that's been sitting there for over a thousand years, and it was completely destroyed. With all this bombing, that created a huge humanitarian crisis where refugees started flooding the country. They started fleeing the country for safety, for a better situation, to be able to feed their kids, to educate them if they can. We have a full generation of kids in Syria that's left without education in the last few years. And we will not see the results of that until the next few years. So as you see here, they will go to Turkey in the north, and then they will ride those death boats. If you remember that, it was, you know, the, the problem was at its peak in 2015, where we had so many of those boats capsized and a lot of people died while we were trying to flee to, to Europe. Remember Elon? This is the kid that his body was, the shore, was uh, washed ashore, you know, when the boat was capsized and all his family was killed. In some places where they were fleeing in Europe, some countries put barbed wires to prevent those refugees from coming in, yet people found a way to get in. If we look at this humanitarian crisis and compare it to other crises that we had in the world at that time, if you remember Hurricane Katrina and how horrible that was, it affected 1.7 million people. Haiti earthquake, you know, and all the international aid that we, we uh, provided and all the casualties that happened, that affected 3.5 million people. The Indian Ocean tsunami affected about 5 million people, whereas the Syrian crisis affected 12 million people. We had about seven million people who were displaced internally inside Syria because they lost their homes, they lost you know, uh, their places where they used to live, and they had to go to different places and lived in tents and camps uh, for years. And some of them still live in those camps as we speak now. We had about five million people 
who were refugees all over the country. There hasn't been any Syrian family that has not been affected by this. I myself have a brother who is now in Turkey with his, with his family, and I have another brother who is in Norway. I have a cousin in Brazil. I have an, uh, my uncle actually in Brazil, and my cousins are in Sweden. So they're all over the country. We used to go visit in the summer, and all the cousins will get together and get to you know, know each other. Now they are all over the world, and we always wonder whether they're going to get to see each other again or whether they're going to have this tight relationship that they once had. So this was a few weeks ago when um, there was a protest on the New York streets. Uh, it's actually not a protest. It was you know, commemorating the 11th uh, anniversary of the Syrian revolution. It was March 15, 2022. And people were, uh, you know, in Times Square there in support of the Ukrainian people because we Syrians know firsthand what the Russian government is capable of doing and what kind of destruction they are willing to impose, you know, if they decide to do so. And that's what they're doing in Ukraine right now. Even the people inside Syria, they're showing support to Ukraine because they know exactly what they're going through. So with all this humanitarian crisis that we had, we had to step in to try to provide some help to those displaced Syrians. That healthcare system in Syria was not good to begin with, but it was still okay. People have access to healthcare, um, uh, probably not all the specialties and not all the most advanced procedures that we have here, Nevertheless, you know, we were doing fairly well. But after all of this, actually a lot of doctors fleed the country and left with their family looking for safety. So uh, we had to step in as an organization, as a Syrian American Medical Society. This is an organization that I'm very proud to say I am an active member of, and I have been an active member since its inception in 1998. When we were first based, when we first started, there was no war. And actually, we started the organization thinking that we want to give back to the motherland. We want to exchange experiences with the doctors there, try to help them, learn from them about the challenges that they have, try to provide solutions to all of this. And we were really successful in the first few years. As I said, we were holding conferences in the summer every single year. And, you know, some of the top physicians from this country will go there, perform surgeries, uh, do interventional procedures, heart cath, and stuff like that. But then when the revolution started and we had all those casualties and all this humanitarian crisis, we had to make a choice. And believe it or not, some of the people there, they still thought that we should stay on the side. You know, We should not be involved uh, in such a political conflict there. And they thought that we are, you know, humanitarian organization, and we want to do, you know, uh, well for everyone. But after all the destruction, after all the lives that were lost, and after all the brutality that we saw from the regime, we could not stay silent anymore. There are parts in Syria, in the northern part of Syria now, where there is no government control and there is no access to health care. That's when Sam stepped in, and they were able to build hospitals and clinics and uh, ICUs where we can take care of patients, and I will tell you all uh, about those places. In the last 11 years since the revolution started, Sam's have been able to provide over $200 million in funds, you know, to those uh, patients in need in northern Syria, uh, in the surrounding countries, in Turkey, in Lebanon, in Jordan, in Iraq, in Greece, and even in other places. When COVID hit here, we were able to, to help even in the United States, uh, uh, in uh, India. Uh, we had, you know, when we had the hurricane in Houston, uh, we, we were able to help too. I think we really have a depth of knowledge on how to deal uh, with emergencies like this right now. 
and we are working really hard on establishing some connections with the Ukrainian people to try to help them to, uh, you know, try to deal with this tragedy that they have. SAMS is dedicated to delivering dignified quality health care free of charge to patients in need. And your support for that is very important in saving lives. That's what we depend on at SAMS. We have some grants that we get from governments and organizations, but we really depend on generous donors like you to help those people. In 2021 alone, we had about 2 million beneficiaries in Syria that benefited from all the programs that SAMS provided. We have about 85 staff members in Ghazi Antab, which is, uh, an ordern, which is a bordering city of Syria in Turkey. And we have about 1,700 staff members in Syria. We actually, we have doctors and nurses and medics that we are paying their salary to keep them in Syria so they do, so they do not leave the country and provide health care to people there. We were able to equip 12 hospitals, including three dedicated for reproductive health and one for pediatric inpatient and critical care. We have 15 primary and secondary health care clinics. We have four COVID-19 inpatient care and ICU units uh, that provides uh, 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 pediatric section, pediatric services also. We have one ambulance system there. We have renal dialysis, patients who depend on dialysis to stay alive. They lost all access to, to dialysis and we were able to start dialysis units in northern Syria and dialyze them. Not here in this country, you know, this is you know, the subject that I am very involved in because I am a nephrologist and I deal with dialysis on a regular basis. Here we're supposed to dialyze people three times a week, four hours each session. There, because of the need and because of the lack of equipment and everything else, we were dialyzing people twice a week, two and a half to three hours each session. So barely to keep them alive and in this way, we are able to help more people than we could uh, handle. A couple of areas where there was a huge need for, one is rehabilitation center and physical therapy. We had a lot of amputees. We had a lot of shrapnel injuries there. We had people who needed to be rehabilitated to become productive members of society. This is something that we realized early on and we partnered with some other organizations to be able to provide that in Syria and in the surrounding countries. The other major issue that we are still struggling with, to be honest with you now, is the mental toll that this war takes on people there, especially the children who are growing up not knowing anything better than this. We had all kind of uh, psychiatric help, we have telehealth clinics uh, that we try to help people from here, but the need is huge and we really cannot meet this need and we're still struggling with that and working uh, on this. We have quite few wonderful psychiatrists that they're starting programs. We're trying to train people inside Syria um, like social workers, like you know, people who can deal with crisis to counsel people and try to help them out uh, as much as possible. In this slide here, you see the services that we provide on a monthly basis. As of, you know, as I said, last year in 2021, we almost had 190,000 medical services every single month of the year. And those services, you know, uh, it's either a doctor's visit, it could be deliveries, it could be dental care, it could be lab services, dialysis sessions, all kinds of services that you can imagine. And most of the need, as I said, in the northwest part of Syria, um, 
uh, where there is no access to health care, that's where most of the need is. There is some in the north northeast part of Syria and on the northern borders, but mainly it is in the northwest. Just to tell you about some of the services that we provide in Syria and how it impacted people's life. Fatima is a 39-year-old lady, very young lady, who came to us with abdominal pain. And after examining her, we found that she had a mass in the abdomen that turned out to be cancerous. Uh, within a very short period of time, we were able to arrange for her surgery, where she ended up with a hysterectomy, and it turned out that she had a malignant cancer, and she needed chemotherapy afterwards. She had three sessions of chemotherapy, and thank God, you know, she did very well, and she was back into society uh, where hopefully she can be productive again. Jordan is the country that is to the south of Syria, where we had quite a lot of refugees there. Uh, in Jordan, the refugees stayed in refugee camps. Unfortunately, uh, very few of them can uh, get to the cities and uh, live decent life uh, if they are financially, financially capable. But if they're not, they end up being in refugee camps uh, where they are living in tents. And you can imagine, you know, this past winter and all the winters past, how they were surviving during these times. So in Jordan, we have the Zaatari camp that we provide imaging services, childhood vaccinations, uh, standardized quality dental care, and it is sponsored by SAMS private funds. We have medical missions that go to Jordan and the neighboring countries. And I was privileged to be on one of those missions in 2018, and I really wanted to go back, but because of the pandemic, um, our missions you know, were stopped for the last two years, and we just started again now, so hopefully we will be able to go again. There is a retina treatment project that we have in Jordan that helps people with uh, eye problems. We have medication support and management for transplant patients. When I was there, I was able to see, if I remember correctly, about 18 or 19 kidney transplant patients that really depending on us to bring them their anti-rejection medicines. I remember I took the medicine with me from the United States and we were able to dispense enough until the next mission comes and brings them you know, more medications. And without those medications, they would have definitely lost their kidneys if not their lives. So we have a lot of programs that's going on in Jordan, we have about 23 staff members. Uh, we have 28 members in the Zatari camp that I am talking about. And we have all those services that we have listed there. One of the things that we did when we started going to the neighboring countries, we did not just treat Syrian refugees. We treated people who needed to be treated and did not have the means to be treated there. So if there were some Jordanians that require you know, certain kind of help with certain procedure, we were able to provide that and we worked you know, uh, with the Jordanian government on that and for that we are grateful. Here is Roa, a 16-year-old girl that had type 1 diabetes. Um, she came complaining that she cannot study anymore. You know, when she tries to you know, open her book, she's not seeing well enough to study. And after examination, it was found that she had cataract. You would think cataract is you know, a disease of elderly people, not kids, but definitely it happens in this age group. And we had several ophthalmologists that went there and uh, um, doing one eye in one uh, mission trip, and the next eye in the next mission trip, and now Roa is back studying and going back to school. The surgery for her there, it would have cost them $1,000 to be done in a private clinic. Now you may think $1,000, it may not be a lot of money, but for those refugees, it's a life saving. 
it's a huge amount of money that they could not afford it. In Lebanon, we had more projects in Lebanon and mainly on the eastern part of Lebanon that was closer to Syria. We had 15 staff members and 15 program staff. Uh, we had some grants from the Canadian government and other places uh, that will allowed us to do those programs there. And some of those programs were winterization, emergency response, especially in the Biqa'a Valley. Um, winter there is really brutal, especially for those people who are living in tents and they do not have you know, proper clothing and stuff like that. So this was a major uh, success and helped a lot of people um, you know, over the years. We had medical missions for interventional and surgical services. Uh, you know, that as I said, again, stopped in the last couple of years, but in, you know, hopefully we will resume shortly. Uh, we have a refugee primary health care clinic where refugees can come and see a doctor or a nurse practitioner and get the care that they need. We had essential psychological support and health education services for refugees in the Biqa'a Valley. And the list goes on and on. One thing that I failed to mention when I was talking about Syria, because of the need that we had in Syria, we actually started training programs uh, where uh, you know, students who are interested in going into healthcare sector, they will be able to do so. We had a midwifery program that was very successful. Uh, we had some residents that we did a lot of uh, telecommunication with them on the WhatsApp, you know, if you are familiar with WhatsApp. We communicate with them there on a regular basis about uh, uh, study habits, study resources, and what they need to do. And we are in the process of graduating, you know, uh, some students this year, hopefully, uh, that they will be a great asset, uh, you know, to, to the Syrian people there. Here you go. Now I found it. So I talked about the winterization efforts, and I told you about how brutal winters are uh, in that area of the world and how it impacted those refugees. Uh, Turkey, Turkey is one of the countries that, as Syrians, we are very grateful for. There are about 4 million refugees in Turkey. Some of them left, but still above, above three and a half million people. And luckily, you know, the, the Turkish government allowed them to work, allowed them to be, uh, you know, to provide for their families, provided a lot of free health care to them uh, in terms of surgeries and access to health care and all of this. So if you see here, we have only 10,000 beneficiaries in Turkey, although we have the largest number of refugees there. And that's the reason why, because you know, the Turkish government took care of them. We have a lot of staff there. We have uh, uh, many facilities, 136 staff members, because for a while, most of our staff was stationed in Turkey in the northern part, and they could not get into Syria except when the shelling stops or when it is safe for them to go down. So most of the staff members uh, were stationed in Turkey. And in Turkey itself, uh, we have mental health, psychosocial support, and medication management and physical rehabilitation services that is available to all the refugees. Here is one of the medics who was a nurse by training and ended up being a paramedic. He is from the northwest part of Syria. He says in this, I work as a nurse in the ambulance where I move patients between hospitals and we transport critical conditions, patients to Turkey for border crossings. He added, during the bombing, we quickly head to the place in order to do our duty and evacuate the injured. Imagine that. When you hear about, you know, there's a bombing or there's something exploding somewhere, the human nature is to run away from that place, look for safety. 
here they had the duty to go in where the bombing is, not thinking about their own safety, but thinking about saving lives and taking care of the people that they needed to be taken care of. We had some programs in Iraq, and last year we had about 10,000 beneficiaries there. Uh, we have about seven staff members in Iraq and 88 members in the northeastern part of Syria, uh, and we had similar uh, services that we have provided in that area. If you remember in 2015, I believe 15 or 16, uh, we had uh, a refugee crisis in, Greek, in Greece where uh, those people who were able to go on the death boats and go from Turkey to Greece were trapped in Greece because they could not leave there. And, uh, you know, the EU will not allow them to get in there and all kind of political things that went on at that time. So at that time, we decided that we're going to go and have our clinics in Greece itself. And this turned out to be a huge success. And again, we did not just treat Syrian refugees there. We treated all kind of refugees or people who needed help. We had quite a bit of African population that was there and we were able to treat. Beyond Syria, as I told you, you know, uh, to Ukraine now, we are trying to work with them. We have been able to send some supplies. We are really trying to network with a lot of people there and um, try to exchange at least information. As I said, we really have a lot of experience taking care of war injuries, and we might be able to help them get uh, their, their programs set up faster, learn from the mistakes that we went through, and hopefully we will be able to do that uh, once the war settles there, if Putin decides to. Because it seems like the international community is not willing to stop him. I don't know whatever happened to the term never again. It makes you think, you know, it's like, you know, we never learn from history. It's history repeating itself in front of our eyes. And we stand here talking and saying things, but really no clear actions there. When COVID hit, this was a big problem, you know, in Syria because uh, there was no testing available, no treatment available, even actually to the areas that was controlled by the government. Uh, so in northwest Syria, we were able to provide testing and treatment. We had an ICU um, that was dedicated for COVID patients, and it's still operating, and luckily the number of patients is going way down nowadays. Again, we talked about medical education. Uh, which is really a necessity in Syria. We don't have enough people to take care of the uh, people who need to be taken care of. We have the midwifery and nursing program in northwest Syria. We have several uh, 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 graduations there. We have mental health certification program. We have residency and scholarship program in Syria, Jordan, Turkey, and some other uh, uh, countries like Bosnia. Bosnia also, we, we uh, had our conference there once. Um, if you remember with the Bosnian war, they also had a lot of injuries, a lot of amputees, and they had a lot of experience taking care of that, and we tried to partner with them and learn from them. So, so we have some alliance with them. Uh, we have the Syrian Board of Medical Specialty. We have medical school there. Uh, that's dedicated to those uh, uh, Syrian students and trying to entice them to stay inside the country to take care of those uh, uh, people. I just want to show you less than a two minute. How are you going to do it? Okay. What do I push here? Uh, I should have done this. Here we go. So this is less than two minutes, and it will tell you about what we've done. I'll let you do it. In 2021.
So as you know, the crisis in Syria is not over yet. It started 11 years ago, and the misery continues, and the suffering continues. There's still a lot of humanitarian assistance needed in that part of the world. As I mentioned earlier, about 6.7 million were displaced internally inside Syria. There are about Three million people in northwest Syria, including many women and children, who continue to live in internal displacement camps with limited access to food, water, shelter, sanitation, and health care. Relentless attacks on civilians and civilian infrastructures continue in northwest Syria as we speak right now costing innocent lives, civilian injuries, and severe psychological stress. And SAMS is one of the most trusted NGOs on the ground in Syria and in the surrounding countries uh, that is providing urgently needed medical care that is free of charge for everyone. I hope that after you heard about you know, what's going on there and the tremendous work that SAMS is doing in the area, that you'll be able to support them you know, in whatever amount you can. Um, you know, uh, there's a saying, you know, the best is you know, the, even if, this, if you provide little, but if it is consistent, it might be better. So if you wanna do like monthly payments, even of $10, $25, whatever you can afford, you can go on their website and do that. If you visit smile.amazon.com and you choose your charity of choice as Sam's, we receive about half a percent of all the purchases that you make there. They may not sound too much, but every penny helps. So please you know, think about Sam's when you do that and think about supporting them and think about the lives that you are saving by doing so. One of the things that we are most proud of as SAMS member that our overhead is extremely low. From every dollar you give, 94 cents go to patient care. Our overhead is only 6%, and it pays for the people who are there in, the, in Syria and the surrounding countries. Most of the people who are here in the United States, we are providing this service on a volunteer basis, and we don't get paid for it. Thank you very much again for inviting me, and I'll be happy to take any questions if you have any. Do we have any questions from the audience? Okay, we can start off, I'll, I'll start with the question. Sure. Can you talk about why underground hospitals needed to be built in Syria, northern Syria and the revelation that Russian planes were specifically targeting hospitals in Syria? Thank you very much for asking this question. Um, this was a necessity for us to survive there. We were trying to provide healthcare in northwest Syria in regular clinic and clinics and hospitals and we were bombarded day and night by the Russian um, you know, uh, airplanes and uh, uh, airfare and welfare that uh, has 
destroyed all those hospitals. So we felt that if we build some underground, it will be safer you know, for our staff members, it will be safer for the patient where we can provide the services. And unfortunately, even then, when we build one underground, we got hit big time. We had actually CAT scan machines that we moved from here to Syria. We had all kind of medical equipments that they needed for uh, cath lab, for GI lab, for surgeries that needs to be done. And all of those things were destroyed over and over and over again, and we were able to rebuild it. So yeah, at some point, you know, we were operating, you know, in cave hospitals underground to be able to provide the services uh, to those people. Yes, sir. Can you kind of talk about and paint the reality of doctors and how you get into Syria, Syrian doctors, and how they get there and the dangers of just getting to Syria in the first place? Absolutely. Uh, most of the time, if we're going to the northern part of Syria, it's always through Turkey. So we go to Turkey and we go to the bordering countries. Uh, we have offices there that they really know the safest routes and the safest times to take people inside. That's how they evacuate you know, injured people from there. And uh, uh, I, I did not go myself you know, to tell you all about it, but I heard from my friends and colleagues. Um, they had times where they were really bombarding them at the time you know, they're entering Syria. They caught them through a satellite or something and they were, you know, uh, 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 shooting at them. Um, it was, I mean, you cannot imagine the horror that they go through to get to those areas. And even when you are inside Syria, it's never safe. Uh, that even if you, you think that you are with the people you know and the people who know the area, it's never safe to be there. So this, this was a tremendous risk that they were taking, but we really didn't have any other choice. If you want to save lives and take care of those patients, we had no other choice. Yes, ma'am. Do you have more students? I know you talked about programs there to teach right. the medical services there. How many students are you trying to get into our country or can we do that now? Unfortunately, as Kendra mentioned earlier, because of the Trump ban that uh, you know, it was imposed in 2016, we have not been able to bring um, you know, many Syrians here. We have uh, quite few you know, students that they finished their exams and the requirement to start training in the United States, and they could not do that because of that. Uh, to be honest with you, after those years of war and suffering, we found out that we need to do it ourselves. You cannot depend on anybody else. In my opinion, that was part of the reason why the opposition did not succeed you know, in toppling the regime in Syria because they were always you know, either depending on the Gulf area or Turkey or the United States or NATO. And in my opinion, unless we do it ourselves, it's not going to work. So it's the same thing. That's where the idea came from. Keep them there, training them, train them there, Keep, give them the best education you can and let them take care of the people uh, you know, the best way they can. We have a question from our online chat. Is it possible for American families to sponsor a Syrian family and bring them to the United States? Ooh, I don't really know the answer to that. I mean, the first thing, they have to have a visa to be able to come. And if they cannot get that, uh, it's going to be impossible to bring them here. Uh, I don't think, you know, there's no embassy uh, in Syria right now. I know some people, they go to uh, United Arab Emirates, to Saudi Arabia, to Jordan sometimes. But sometimes also, if you are of Syrian nationality, they don't allow them. Uh, to go to an embassy that is not in their own country. So um, I really need to do some uh, research on that and get back to you on it. I'm not aware of any way uh, we can help that. That would be great if we can do it. You know, if you, you can sponsor somebody inside Syria if you want to. So if you, if you want to help this way and all this money that comes to Sam's, 
you know, you'll be able to help, you know, a family survive there uh, for, for, for years on, on this support that we provide here. Another question from the chat. Can you talk about any efforts from the current administration to reverse the damage that the, the travel ban from 2016 has caused? I hope I can tell you yes. I wish that's gonna be my answer, but it is not. Unfortunately, it was not just you know, the administration that, you know, the, the Trump administration that did not help much there. As I said, you know, when the Obama administration was there and they drew the line in the sand about chemical weapons, nothing happened after, uh, you know, Assad used chemical weapons and the serene gas. Um, we've been working, we have several political organizations that are working inside the United States and working with several members of the Congress on both sides of the aisle. Uh, to try to bring, you know, uh, to try to, to, to help any way we can. We actually established a caucus, a Syrian caucus in Congress that is sponsored by uh, uh, two congressmen, one a Democrat, one a Republican, and we have more than 100 members of Congress that are, you know, that involved in this caucus. Um, we are very, in the very, you know, early on in the political process. It's infant, infancy for us and it's baby steps that we are taking to try to work, uh, you know, with the U.S. government and, and see how we can help. There has been resistance on the American government side to impose, in 2013 and 14, we were adamant about imposing no-fly zone you know, with this bombardment that was killing innocent people. If we thought, you know, if you have just an area where there's no fly zone, at least people can be safe. They will not be killed if you build even tents for them. But the uh, United States and the international community was not willing to do that. Uh, uh, the same people who were running the uh, 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 foreign affairs at the time of uh, President Obama, they're the same people that they're doing it now at the time of President Biden, and I don't think that has changed. That doesn't mean that we stop trying. Uh, we're gonna keep the pressure on. We're gonna try to grow as organizations, as political organizations separate from SAMS. SAMS is non-political, non-religious. We don't have anything to do with that, but uh, I am also involved in those political organizations that we're trying to keep the pressure and try to help as much as we can. have another online question. Is SAMS currently seeking any partnerships, perhaps with medical schools, to provide additional telehealth services? We actually have a lot of partnerships that we have established over the years. Um, I cannot give you the exact names, but I know we have SAMS members who are involved in academic positions that they were able to bring their you know, school on board and try to help with telehealth. We have a lot of non-Syrian physicians that go with us on missions. Actually, the mission I was in in 2018, we have people from six different continents. We have somebody from Australia that came with us. So we are trying to form those alliances and try to get the help, not just, you know, American universities, European universities. We've been to Bosnia, as I told you. Uh, all other places, they are actually uh, the president of SAMS, uh, society and the president of Sam's Foundation, they are in Europe now visiting eight countries in seven days trying to advocate, you know, for the Syrian cause and try to form alliances again to try to help the Syrian people. Yes, ma'am. Um, so I know they said physicians. Um, do you take allied health professionals like nurse practitioners and physician assistants on the medical missions? Yes, ma'am. We do that. We take nurses. We take technicians. We need uh, nurse anesthetists. Um, you know, uh, anybody who is willing to go and help. Each, a, every mission, there is a, a person in charge of that mission, and they have a theme. Like if it is a cardiac mission, that's what they try to get cardiac nurses and technicians and all of this. If it's going to be like you know uh, more of eye surgeries, they try to tap into that field. 
So yes, we take all kinds, and actually when I was there, I had, you know, I had so many nurses and nurse practitioners. In those primary care clinic, there is, you know, they can be tremendous help to all of us. Pe people there have not seen a doctor in quite some time. They used to wait for us to come on those missions to be able to see the doctors. And the people, the staff on the ground, they used to, you know, we coordinate with them. They know when we're coming and, uh, you know, have a very busy day planned for us. You know, we usually go on a mission uh, for six days. Uh, the holiday there is Friday, so we start Saturday and it goes until Thursday. Somebody, yes, Walid. Why was the response from the West to Russia and Ukraine very different than Syria? You, you want to answer that question? question? <laughs> <laughs> well, the question? Yes, yes, I will repeat the question. question. Walid is asking why, why is the response from the U.S. to what's going on in Ukraine is different from the response to what is still going on in Syria. Uh, I don't want to get into politics too much, but unfortunately double standards are everywhere. If you talk, look at the media coverage. The media coverage of the issue is completely different. You know, we were pegging, you know, to, to, to go on international or national media to show what's going on in Syria years ago. Um, and now look, you know, what they were, the coverage for Ukraine. It is just politics, you know, I'm, I'm going to leave it there. <laughs> yes, sir. Partial follow-up to that. Do you think that the awareness that Ukraine is having could be beneficial to what's happening in Syria? Absolutely. I think, you know, this is, you know, a very good question. And, uh, you know, as I said, you know, the Syrian people are very supportive of Ukrainians and what's going on there because they know firsthand what happened to them. And I really think, you know, this might be an area where we may need to work together. Um, and it's not just Syria and Ukraine. I think every oppression anywhere in the world, it should be treated the same way. So anything like this happens, any part in the world, we should, we should have a meaningful response to stop it and stop the suffering of people there. So, yeah, I think, you know, this is a great area we need to explore. Any other questions? I have one more. Okay. How can people help besides donating money to organizations like SAMS? Uh, really, you know, the things that we are doing in SAMS is, uh, you know, uh, the missions that I talked about, you know, people, if they have the expertise and the time to do it, uh, you know, we can do that. Uh, advocacy is one of the things that we have been learning over the years and if people have expertise in that I think you know we can benefit from that uh, money is going to be a big uh, thing of course uh, we we had one year where our budget was close to 40 million dollar uh, that was in the peak during the Aleppo thing now our budget is close to 20 million dollar a year so really there is a lot of need there I'm trying to think if there are any other ways we can help with Sam's Basel. Can you think of anything? You are a Sam's member. Supporting the organization, volunteering, even if you're a student. I went to the 2018 mission as a dental student, and uh, it was the best experience I had. I uh, helped a lot of people. I think we saw a lot of uh, around 500 patients within five, five days. Uh, so whatever you can, just uh, support volunteering, advocacy and donating. And, you know, I want to build up on this mission to really, to be honest with you, I echo what you said. It's, it helps, helped me more than it helped the refugees. You feel that you have, a, you know, we, we are helping people every day here and you think, you know, that you're doing the right thing. But when you go and see the need there and see what those people are, you know, how they're living, how they're suffering and all of this, it really helps you. And I wanted to go back really after the first one if it was not for the pandemic. So try to have that experience. It's really unique. I have a lot of physicians in Onsboro that went to Haiti. I have a, a orthopedic surgeon. There was a lot of orthopedic injuries and uh, required surgeries. This guy goes there now every three months. He is hooked on it. It's like, you know, the need is not there anymore, but he loves to go there and help people. It is really a unique experience. 
Yes, ma'am. I heard on the news today that um, with the United States saying that they are, were taking in 100,000 you know, Ukrainian refugees, that now there will be a lift on the ban at our southern border. And again, to me, that goes back to the question that was asked about the difference in the response. Is there, uh, I'm just wondering, will that have, will that be helpful to like the Syrian caucus to maybe, uh, you know, put more pressure to lift that ban on Syrian travel? I, I think, you know, it will be very helpful, but I will tell you from experience, the refugees who came to the United States, I, I don't know, it's a different system that we're dealing with. Those who went to Europe, um, they were taken care of. They were provided, you know, a uh, place to live. They were provided food. They provided healthcare access. They provided, you know, even money, you know, to take care of their necessities and stuff like that. When refugees come here to the United States, from what I understand, we've been involved now with the uh, Afghani refugees that, you know, we had an influx of them over the last few months. Uh, I think they get a stipend. Uh, I heard it's about $1,200. One stipend per person, one time thing. And that's about it. And they're on their own. Uh, we have a lot of religious organizations, churches, mosques, and people that are trying to pick up the tap and help them. And they find a place for them to live. But, you know, we try to rent places for those people, and the landlords don't want to uh, give us the place because this person that just came in, with, they have no records, no credit history. So they don't want their lease to be in their name, rather it's in the religious organization name. So we do have a lot of obstacles here for the refugees to come. The nice thing about it here that, you know, hopefully with their kids growing up in this uh, system here and learning, and becoming more productive members, you know, they will integrate much better than they do in Europe. Uh, this is this integration you don't see there, but the benefits that they get there and in Canada is much more for somebody who starts from scratch and they don't have much to start with. I heard, I saw another, here you go. This is a little bit outside of uh your main topic, but you said that there's a whole generation of, um, of uh, kids and growing into adulthood now who, uh, who have missed education. Um, do you know what's going on at all in the, in the field of sort of trying to remedy education deficits? Yes. Uh, there are quite a few organizations that are working on that. I know one of them is Karam Organization in uh, Turkey. Uh, there are some that are inside Syria that they're trying to help. Uh, the problem that I'm talking about, you know, for the kids who were school age, you know, five, six, seven years old, they were supposed to enter in 2000, let's say 12 or 13, when things were at its peak, and they lost three, four, five years there. Now they're like 10, 12 years old, and they don't have a first grade education. So it becomes really an obstacle. Yes, we want to try to help them, but we are trying to do uh, you know, special schools for this generation where they don't feel like you don't want to put the 10, 12-year-old with the 6-year-old and teach them the same thing. So this is one of the obstacles. But we are trying to tackle that. Unfortunately, as I said, the need is huge. Despite all the war and all the, the destruction that happened there, people were still <laughs> making babies. And we had, you know, as you saw there, you know, I don't know, 26,000 deliveries or something like that. That was astonishing to me for something like this to happen during wartime. But uh, uh, we need to work on that. All right. Any final questions? I have a few closing remarks, but right. um, please join me in thanking Dr. Murad. Well, thank you very much. As we wrap up our evening together, I just want to thank everyone so much for joining us this evening in person and virtually.
And a special thanks to Oswald Marketing for making the live stream possible um, for those uh, unable to be here in person to be able to join and support this event. For those of you who are able, we do want to reiterate and encourage you to visit the SAMS website to make a financial contribution to support their incredible medical mission. For those of you who are here in person, there are flyers at each seat that um, provide a QR code that you can scan with your phone or the website where you can visit and make your donation. For those of you joining virtually, the link to, Sam's donation, to the SAMS donation page is available in the chat. And if you'd like to continue learning about our work as the Scholars for Syria organization, or have any follow-up questions, I invite you to follow our Facebook page where we constantly um, post updates. Again, we thank you for your support this evening and hope that you have a wonderful rest of your night. Thank you.